Hello everyone, this is uh, Juno VR, Improving a Breath Sensor for Virtual Reality Applications by Thomas Driver and Brandon Perry. Good morning, my name is Tom Driver. And I'm Brandon Perry. And our advisor is Dr. Morgan Benton. And for our capstone, we um, took a breath sensor that was developed by a company named Juno VR, and we approved upon it, and we turned it into something that looks just like this. And so you're probably wondering who Juno VR is. Um, Juno VR is a small company. Um, we were given this capstone project, thankfully. Um, our faculty advisor, he went to a conference and then I met uh, Chris Smith. He's the founder and CEO of Juno VR. Um, so pretty much Juno VR's overall goal is to make virtual reality experiences for relaxation, meditation, and mindfulness. And Chris, He's always been fascinated by the brain, psychology, and intersection of technology and everyday life. Um, in high school, he created 3D maps for games. And then when he re reached college, he uh, completed programming, business, and mechanical modeling design courses before graduating. Um, he worked with the sensors at National Instruments, and through this, he got more familiar with different types of sensors and projects and integrating it with different types of facilities. Um, over here we have Eric Levin, he's the founder and CTO. Um, he also is very familiar with meditation practices and he's been running his own uh, practice for the past nine years. He has a master in computer science and he has a lot of experience with virtual reality applications and he makes a lot of different scenarios such as the one we're gonna see later in our demo. And through Juno VR, they gave us pretty much an idea of what they want to do. And from there, that's where we implemented our design and started getting started. All right. <clears throat> so this is their original device that they created. And what it does is it tracks a user's breath and it displays them um, in a meditation simulation. And what that does is it allows a user to visualize their breath and it helps them focus in on it. Um, this really piqued mine and Brandon's interest because we've both been very interested in meditation ourselves, but we've always had a hard time actually, you know, clearing our mind and, and getting the results that other people see from meditation. So we saw this device as a way for us to learn how to meditate for one of the first times. Um, it really excited us and we were very excited to improve upon their original design right here. And so how this works is it's all about focused breathing. And so how it works is you want to focus the attention on your breath, and then from there your attention wanders from the breath and you acknowledge the current focus of attention. And then from there you redirect your attention to the breath and the cycle repeats over and over again. What this allows you to do is to just clear your mind, focus on the task at hand, and let everything go away and just kind of relax and achieve mindfulness. <clears throat> well, what is mindfulness? Mindfulness is defined as a mental state achieved by focusing one awareness on the present moment while calmly acknowledging and accepting one's feelings, thoughts, and bodily sensations. The idea of mindfulness originates from Buddhism, and most of mindfulness teachings come from Buddhas. In 1979, John Kabat-Zinn introduced a program of mindfulness-based stress reduction at the University of Massachusetts Medical Center, which gave mindfulness credibility as a therapeutic discipline. Mindfulness this started to gain popular um, around the late 1990s when attention began to increase exponentially. Today it is no longer confined to stress reduction based therapy. In psychotherapy <coughs> it has proven a potential tool for helping patients deal with conditions such as depression, anxiety, and obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, so. When you take this mindfulness idea and meditation and mix it with VR, it has a really cool um, result. Um, one of the cool things about um, <clears throat> meditation and VR is that it really puts you in a whole nother state. It really allows you to focus in on the present moment because no one's there with you in this nice um, secluded um, environment. And you know, it's, it's difficult to meditate if there's a lot of noise or other people in the room. So with virtual reality, um, you can basically meditate anywhere now if you have a mobile um, virtual reality headset. Um, it's really, it's going to change the way people interact and meditate um, all over the world. Also, for people, even if you're in a quiet room, um, <clears throat> it, it can be hard for you to achieve mindfulness, 
but um, the using meditation with a VR headset, especially using our sensor with it, kind of acts as training wheels. So it kind of teaches you how to focus in on your breath, how to train yourself to achieve mindfulness. And then the hopes, just like with training wheels, is that you can meditate without the VR headset and without the breath sensor eventually on your own. And so combining this virtual reality aspect, we want to know how popular is virtual reality nowadays. So in 2016, uh, we have the projected sales here. We have the Samsung Gear VR, which sold 5 million units. Uh, as you guys may or may not know, the Samsung Gear VR is more of a mobile virtual reality headset. Uh, allows you to use your phone instead of a pretty much a beefy computer that needs a lot of CPU and processing. Uh, second, we got the Oculus Rift with 3.6 million units sold, and then the HTC Vive with 2.1 million. As you see in this chart right here on the right, this is, um, you'll notice there's a strong demand for VR headsets after price cuts. So when this graph was made, this was the third quarter of 2017. And as you can see, there's significant price drops in the VR headsets. And actually one of the most sold is actually the new Sony PlayStation VR headset. Um, as we know, PlayStation, it's really used for gamers and a lot of people buy this. And so now that they release this virtual reality headset for a gaming system, we can see how popular it is and how much potential growth is gonna be over time. And so with virtual reality, we wanna kind of focus on kind of the cultural dynamics. What can it offer us? Uh, virtual reality can offer us a new system of learning. Uh, we see today that if schools have the budget, they actually invest in virtual reality headsets and the kids wear this and they can go on any field trip that they want, whether it's the Smithsonian or any museum, and they can learn firsthand through the use of virtual reality. It also allows a lot of diverse users. So whether you're a gamer, into meditation, or in type, into any type of scenario settings, this will allow everyone to kind of come together and kind of share one common bond and have a unity. And this is really important because, as we know, there's a lot of advancements in technology. Virtual reality lets us, essentially, what it says right in its name. It's a virtual reality. It brings us close to something that we can't actually do right now or don't have the option. And it allows us to just escape to a different world and <coughs> experience things that we wouldn't nor normally be able to experience. All right, so looking into the ethical dimensions of virtual reality, um, one crazy um, impact that it has is that it can really increase empathy. You can really put yourself in someone else's shoes and feel what it's like to live in their life with virtual reality. Um, for people who are asking for money, when people watch these videos with a VR headset, people actually donate more money and they donate more often when they use a VR headset. And right now we're going to show you one of these videos just to show you how powerful um, the virtual reality experience can be. So as you can see, through virtual reality, we're allowed to see the you know, type of environment that they're at. So in this documentary, you can see the life of this person, her name is Sidra. And here you can see the family and their type of living conditions. And the type of movements that this could happen is, you know, donate to a good cause, whether it's to feed a family or something like that. And when people watch this experience, especially in virtual reality, they just have a more urge to donate to them. We like to keep our bank. All right. Um, <clears throat> so um, another impact that it has is it, um, it lets you simulate moral dilemmas. So psychiatrists actually help patients with phobias such as fear of flying, falling, or public speaking through real-world cognitive therapy treatments. So you don't always have um, the option to give a speech in front of a million people or to go skydiving, but with virtual reality, you can actually put yourself in those situations and see how you would react um, and get that kind of experience before you actually try it. So who are some people that could use this breath sensor into their lives? Obviously, the number one key component would be the video game industry. Um, 
With virtual reality being already a great experience and making it as real as possible for the user, our breathing sensor can just take it over that step. Adding your breath can add so much more to games and just make it almost as if you were there. Um, another profession uh, we can see is the healthcare. Um, actually, there are some reports that healthcare, um, healthcare providers, they actually use this as a studying tool. Um, they'll have a simulation that simulates surgery and it can really put a lot of pressure on them. So if they use this breath sensor, they can really call, like, check their nerves. If they're breathing heavily, if they're nervous, you know, you can implement this to sense that. Uh, obviously, uh, the military can definitely use this as well. Um, there's a lot of focus on breathing and keeping your calm in high tense situations with the adrenaline rush. The breathing sensor can monitor this and then help soldiers prepare for combat or any type of need that they need. And of course, we have our Juno VR enthusiasts and users who are into meditation. Obviously, this is our main goal, and that's what we aim to do so that this breath sensor can, whether it's anxiety, pain relief, whatever it may be, this can help fulfill those needs. All right, <clears throat> so we're going to take a look into the original prototype, first of all. Um, the sensor they use is an anemometer and it uh, detracts, uh, detects changes in temperature um, of your breath and that's over there on the right blown up real big. It's also right here. Um, so it comes um, around to the side of your head and they use an Arduino Micro um, to uh, process all of the different data that's coming in and tell the headset whether you are breathing or not breathing. Um, so it's very exciting. We got this device and we turned it into this. Um, so as you see, we did a lot of work with uh, 3D printing and we turned it Bluetooth, which was really exciting. So before we did that though, we took a step back and we thought, all right, what are all the different possibilities we could do with this device? We weren't just confined to a temperature sensor. So we looked at all different sensors, one being pressure, which would hang down the same way as a temperature one, but detect changes in the pressure of your breath as it leaves your mouth. Uh, we looked into a stretch sensor, which you would wear kind of like a belt, and as you exhale, your chest would expand, and it would detect changes in the wearable um, chest plate that you have on yourself. This didn't work out because it was apparently too hard to calibrate. We talked to Chris about it. Then you have our temperature sensor. Uh, we, we looked into a humidity sensor, which would hang down the same way, but it would detect the changes in moisture in your breath um, as you breathed out. Um, an airflow sensor, uh, it didn't really work out because you'd have to wear it more like a mask, but it would actually um, detect the, the amount of airflow that left your mouth. And then, it's hard to say, but a photo graph, which basically, it takes your heartbeat and it knows your breath rate based on your heartbeat. But that one, um, it's kind of hard to tell if you're breathing in or out, it just knows the rate that you're breathing. Um, so we did end up keeping it with a temperature sensor. Then for power, you know, we could go with either replaceable batteries or rechargeable batteries, and we ended up using rechargeable batteries. And then for processing, we looked into the original Arduino Uno, a Raspberry Pi, and a Blue No Nano. Um, we ended up going with the Blue No Nano because we were really excited about giving this device Bluetooth, um, and that's the decision we made. And so going into this project, we had to figure out what type of housing that we wanted. Um, as Tom mentioned earlier, uh, a mask wouldn't be the best and most ideal. You already have the virtual reality headset taking up half of your face. Having a mask would almost make the user maybe feel claustrophobic or something like that. So we went ahead and scratched that idea. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, the chest strap, uh, we, sh we went away from this idea because it's more expensive, more, um, hard to use and if the user ever had to do any type of calibration then it would just be a nightmare to do. And so we went with our decision which is the non-contact. It's the most comfortable for the user. They don't even know that it's there if they don't think about it. And it's just the overall best use and that's what we went with. And designing our prototype, uh, there's a lot of attributes that we had to consider. Size and weight were a big factor. Obviously with virtual reality how big and somewhat heavy it is. We wanted to minimize the weight so that it doesn't feel like your head's lopsided if it was on one side. And the size, we wanted a nice, small, compact, so that it wouldn't be as noticeable. Uh, cost is essential in any type of product design. 
Uh, the cheaper that we can have it, the cheaper that we can send it out to the users. But of course, we want to maintain high quality and high materials so that we can do this. Accuracy is a big, big part of this process. We want to make sure that the sensor detects that you are breathing and that we can implement it in our simulations, as well as the response time. If you stop breathing, you don't want to have the sensor saying that you're still breathing for a solid 50 seconds. And compatibility is also great. It allows you to use any type of system that you'd like. Right now we have this fitted for the Oculus Rift. However, if you use the HTC Vive, it can fit as well, or any type of mobile, such as the Samsung Gear, Gear VR. All right. <clears throat> so next thing, when we looked at product, uh, designing a product, um, there's a method called Design for X. Um, it's a technique that focuses design activities so that a particular quality attribute is emphasized. Um, DFX focuses on developing quality into a product, not just its characteristics, but the robustness of the process produced it and how the customer or stakeholder perceives the value of the product. So <clears throat> when designing for IoT components, um, the interactions between the humans and things must be mediated properly and the user should always be at the ecosystem center. Um, and when we, when we designed our headset, um, uh, we, um, we looked into all of these um, different um, qualities, which are really good for IoT devices. So for instance, um, we used um, uh, resilience. We wanted to make sure that we had the 3D printed housing so that it would last longer. And we wanted something like um, uh, transferability. We gave it Bluetooth so that you could transfer it, transfer it to other devices that um, are mobile friendly. Um, so three types of design for X are design for manufacturing, assembly, and design for costs. And um, it's really a challenge, it's been a challenge in the past uh, couple decades to look at all three of these. Um, a lot of times people only design for manufacturing, um, you know, and they, they forget to do design for assembly. So basically there's an approach called the multi-objective conceptual design approach where you take a look at all three of these and you weigh out your options and it helps you determine which attributes you want to focus on and which are more important for the design of your product. And so for our prototype, uh, as you mentioned earlier, we did a 3D printed a closing. This was just really um, easy for us because we had the opportunity to have access to 3D printers through JMU X Labs. Um, we also wanted to use Bluetooth capability so that we have a wireless function. Um, the VR, you already incorporate a lot of wires, so we wanted to make sure that it kind of releases a little, a little less load for you. And then we went over rechargeable batteries. Um, this has a lot less waste. It's more consistent because if you have an old battery, and as, as soon as it starts to die, you may see performance issues in your sensor. So this would kind of get rid of that idea as long as you make sure to charge it every time. <clears throat> So one of the tools we used to make the 3D encasing housings was Autodeck Fusion 360. And we wanted to show you guys what our designs look like on the computer before we printed them out. So right here, um, this is the housing for the sensor. And the one on the right is the housing for the Bluno. Um, so using Autodesk uh, Fusion 360 was a really cool experience. We never had any experience actually building anything with 3D. Um, it was very challenging. The learning scale was pretty tough. But um, once we got a hang of it, it was really cool to actually be able to have an idea for uh, a product and see it get built within a couple days. Um, if anyone has not 3D printed here at the JMU um, X Labs, I would give it a try while you were still in school because it is a cool experience and it's a very rewarding time to actually build something. And so here you can see our Blue Note prototype. These are essentially the steps that we do into building <coughs> this process. Uh, far left to the right is kind of how it works. Um, so we can see that we have a LiPo charger that allows us to charge that battery when we connect it to the blue now through solder. And then we also have a switch to turn it on and off. This is really essential when you're using an electronic product. And then all of this is built and then we can close it into our top. And then through this process, we also Run into a couple of challenges. Um, since it's so compact, you know, everything's really tight in there and assembly could be pretty tough. Uh, this is definitely something to consider when we're mass producing this, potentially in the future as a product. 
and other options can be shown at the time to maybe resolve this issue. This would be very cost effective. And this is a quick picture of our anemometer housing. Uh, it's a nice, simple, compact design. We have a nice cutout because at the very tip, that seems like a pitchfork. Those two inner sensors are the ones that essentially do all the magic. And so having that little airway allows us to utilize the breath sensor without any of the other parts potentially getting ruined. Here's a breakdown of our prototype cost. On the left hand side, this is the original Arduino design for our prototype. Uh, our total cost right now is around $38.93. Um, this is all with you know off the shelf products, so the price is gonna be a little bit up there. And our blue note design, um, with everything to the factor, you can see the total cost is somewhere between $65 to $70. Um, this is really, it seems a pretty big gap, but if you think about it, um, if any of you are familiar with like an Xbox controller, a wired is almost $20 to $30 cheaper than the wireless option. And that's because in implementing this Bluetooth, it could be a little cost effective. So this gap's nothing to really worry about. It's just when we want to minimize the cost, um, we want to figure out how to do that. And to do that, all right. You want to run the simulation? Want to talk about this? Yeah, sure. Um, well, uh, to do that, we can make a custom PCB uh, that would essentially combine all the components, and it can bring our cost down significantly. Um, a couple other ideas that we had um, to reduce the manufacturing costs were using a gooseneck tubing. Um, if we were to pass this pro uh, project down, we would recommend that someone replace um, um, the the stem right here with a gooseneck tubing. Um, that way it's just one piece um, instead of heat shrink wrap that um, you can connect easily. Um, we also want to take this time to thank Dr. Morgan Benton. He was a huge help with our project. He actually helped um, jump some of the designs here for the housing and he helped us get it all connected up. It was, it was really challenging to um, you know, take uh, Juno VR software and actually integrate it with the Bluetooth device. Um, we had a fun time doing it, but um, you know, it was a challenge. It was challenging at times. Um, we're now about to do a demonstration, um, so uh, it's going to take about a minute into the simulation for you to actually see uh, my breath. Um, the simulation he has, it has a guided meditation um, going over it, and at some point she's going to say, "All right, now you can see your breath," and that's the point when um, the sensor is triggered and you can actually start seeing your breath. Um. <clears throat> this is a really fun project. Um, so Chris and Eric, they created this simulation. Um, we've never messed with Unreal Engine and it's really cool. Um, it's essentially what a lot of developers use in their games. Uh, you'll actually see some mobile games uh, right in the loading screen of say Unreal Engine. Um, so this is how they can create a lot of cool graphics and Juno VR through the simulation. They created this and incorporated the sensor through a little bit of code. And it was just really fun to experiment with it and kind of almost get a developer insight of how things work. It's going to take a couple more seconds for the simulation to pop up. The way it works is you start off in a dark room and then, you know, as the guided meditation goes on, the simulation comes up. As he said, everything made in the simulation you're about to see was made by the company Juno VR. We're very um, blessed to have them allow us to use their technology. It's good now. As you can see, this is uh, the four simulation that they made. And notice the music playing. As Feeling the sensations you experience as you see the colors and hear the music. Allowing this experience to wash over you.
noticing the sensations as your breath goes in your body, into your lungs. sense of relaxation guiding just listening to this music guiding your mind the calming guiding meditation and the colors and the through virtual reality you can just experience this inner world and just relax calm down and let everything disappear That is our demo for Juno VR, improving a breath sensor for virtual reality applications. Thank you guys so much for coming out, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Any questions? <coughs> that was super cool. Thank you. Um, how the meditation sequence as well, prepared by Juno VR? Or yeah. So, yeah, like, how did how did you actually get the breath to show up? Like, was that you guys, or was that already like a program in there? Yeah. So they actually built the original prototype. Um, it had this sensor to it. Um, the main things that we did is like their prototype. You had to plug it straight into the wall. Um, so we took that and we turned it Bluetooth. It also didn't have any of these encasings on it. It kind of just was wires with like the sensor attached to it. Um, so yeah, we upgraded their device, but they actually invented the prototype yes. and figured out how to connect it with the breath. And so we all we all did that through um, Arduino coding. So we had a script essentially uploaded to the Bluno device, and then through that we altered the code to make sure that you know the breath was as precise as possible, and there's little to no delay right after you stop exhaling. And so that's, sweet. that's how we did that. Any other questions? You guys, um, if this were actually going to become a marketable product, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, how long did how does it long does it take to make one? And like, what things like do you have a, a sense for what the price point would be to like get it to a point where it could be commercially viable? Or so as of now, um, the length is pretty. Extensive. Um, it all varies really uh, with 3D printers. Obviously, the more higher production quality it is, the faster you can print the job. Um, what we were given, um, if you were to print out all setups, it took roughly seven hours to print all the designs. And that's just printing alone. Um, just to build these sensors also takes numerous amount of hours. Um, just making the Bluno design took us almost seven hours to do. Um, just because everything was just so compact and uh, one thing you'd get in, another thing would go wrong and it was just really meticulous and so this process is really lengthy. Um, so it's what, you said the materials are about $70 right now? $70 right and, now. And then so if you spend seven, if you were to like build one from scratch now, like knowing everything you need to do, how many hours do you think it would take, like including printing? For a complete design, um, the printing takes about seven hours. I would say assemb assembly, um, you could do it in, you know, an hour and a half. Okay, so you got eight and a half hours plus seventy dollars, mm -hmm. and then how much do you think you could sell one of these for? It would, currently it'd probably be like ninety dollars. I would say ninety dollars. So that would end up being what? Minus seventy. That's twenty dollars. Divide by your let's say ten hours of labor. That's two bucks an hour. Only <laughs> an hour, hour and a half of labor, you know, for assembly, I would say. Okay. The 3D printer, I don't think you have to pay it. an hourly cost. Yeah. Okay, that's, that's a good point. Yeah. And that's, and that's where our implementation of making it a little more cost effective for us. So we created that custom PCB, um, which is the printed circuit board. Uh, and combined all these components, um, that $70 to make can drop significantly, maybe even to $20. Right. 
And then from there, um, we can still keep a resale value of $60 for something like this to just make virtual reality experience that much better is a steal. Um, you know, you have the virtual reality headsets already going for, you know, maybe $500, adding on a less than $100 sensor to just make things so much better would definitely be in the ballpark. And so from there, if we make those implementations, we could definitely see a larger profit. This could be used for manufacturing processes, labor, assembly, and all that. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, did you guys look into patents at all, or like, would you be able to sell the whole thing? Yeah, so we did look into it. The base of it is their, their prototype, right? Yeah, so we did look into it. Um, there's a, we looked into all the patent processing. Um, so something like this, um, we haven't seen this implemented <laughs> anywhere yet. So it's an original idea, and just be on the basis of that, uh, it is valid for a patent. Um, as of now, we're using these off-the-shelf components. So if we made our own PCB board, stuff like that, we can make this into, and as long as we could supply the designs and everything, we could essentially make this into a patent. That would be up to Juno VR's decision, obviously, to make, since it's uh, their idea. But it's definitely possible. The process is pretty straightforward. Um, by applying for it, they could grant you somewhat of a temporary patent. So as you see, like patent pending products, that's what it is. And it could take up to two years for a full patent to go through the system. But within that first year, you can definitely have, have it in the works with the system. And as they monitor it, review the case and everything like that, then you're on your way. All right, thank you all so much for coming to our capstone. We appreciate y'all showing up early. Have a great rest of your day. Fantastic.